All right, thank you guys for joining us for an invitation to hack vulnerability disclosure programs. We are very excited to have Megan and Matt from Wiley Rain with us, also Alex Rice, uh, co-founder and CTO of HackerOne. Uh, we want to get right into the good stuff to make sure we have uh, the full hour that we can uh, get all the great conversation and material. So the only thing that I, you're going to hear from me is make sure to ask your questions. Uh, on the right-hand side, you're going to see a, a control panel. Just shoot your questions in there throughout the webinar. We'll try and keep it interactive. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. Matt, Megan, take it away. Great. Thanks very much for having us. Um, we're excited about this because we're getting lots and lots of questions from clients about what they need to be doing and thinking about when it comes to vulnerabilities of services, products, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot of government activity going on. So the goal for this hour is to sort of um, orient the listeners to the legal framework for vulnerability disclosures, explain what they are, why people are pursuing them, identify some of the benefits and the risks of these programs, which as outside counsel, Matt and I see as pretty substantial in terms of the risks and um, companies need to be thoughtful in going about this, which is why they work with companies like HackerOne to build these programs. Um, identify some considerations and then leave folks with some takeaways about this. Um, so we're going to jump right in. Please do feel free to put your questions online and as they come in, we'll try and answer them. Um, by way of background, Matt and I are in private practice. We counsel technology and telecommunications, insurers, lots of different companies on aspects of cyber. And that's why this has been top of mind because um, vulnerability disclosure programs are gaining a lot of interest. So Matt's going to walk us through the legal framework that you might confront if you're thinking about these issues. Uh, thanks, Megan. Uh, so to start off, uh, we're going to kind of summarize what the background legal framework here is and talk generally about what a vulnerability disclosure program is. Uh, there's a wide range of disclosure programs that have been set up. Um, this could be anything as simple as an email address on a company's website that says, if you discover a bug or a flaw with our products, please email us here, to much more robust and formal programs that may involve uh, rewards or recognition for uh, the participants, the researchers and white hat hackers who are involved. Um, and what it really comes down to in studying a vulnerability disclosure program is creating a policy that will help manage what can be sometimes a complicated or uncertain relationship between a company and the entity um, on whoever it is on the outside that may have discovered a vulnerability, whether that's a hacker, um, a competitor, or someone else. Um, the legal area for white hat hackers and researchers um, is they're operating in a gray area a lot of times. Uh, there are many laws, most notably the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, that prevent computer hacking, um, and which is uh, defined roughly as unauthorized access. Um, of note in this area, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act does not include any sort of exception for people who have a good motive. So if you have great intentions um, and your whole goal is to hack into something in order to alert someone of a vulnerability, uh, that still is a crime absent um, some sort of consent or exception. Um, and that's really the key here. Uh, the key to vulnerability disclosure programs and creating some uh, structure in this otherwise uncertain area is consent. Uh, the vulnerability disclosure programs, the more robust ones, are in effect uh, providing consent to the public or a selected group within the public to uh, go ahead and hack at a company's products or websites or other services. And so these programs seek to clarify the rules of engagement by uh, describing what that consent will look like. I think one of the big keys that we're going to be talking about throughout here is for a company to structure that consent in a way, um, should they create a vulnerability disclosure program, that on the one hand uh, makes the program effective and provides clear rules of the road um, for whoever on the outside might discover vulnerabilities, but also allows for a company to um, maintain its rights and be able to protect its own interest um, in this uncertain area. So what we've seen, uh, Matt and I practice in Washington, D.C. and interact regularly with many of the government agencies and Congress on issues about cybersecurity. And what we have seen lately is a real trend towards these programs or at least an interest in these programs. 
Um, they're becoming more accepted and indeed expected in certain areas. Um, by way of brief background, uh, most cybersecurity law and policy at the federal level is voluntary and it's predicated on best practices and standards. Um, and what we're seeing is as those best practices and standards are updated, for example, the NIST cybersecurity framework and others, this concept is being included in them as something that a mature company with, cyber, with robust cybersecurity hygiene will consider and possibly include. So several years ago, these programs were sort of novel and they were at the, you know, the tech companies were doing them, uh, but now they've become a bit more mainstream. Uh, but given the sensitivities and potential liabilities, companies are understandably wary about public disclosure and about how to deal with hackers that may have varied motives. And we'll discuss in a little bit um, some of those motives, but when a hacker comes to a company with a flaw, they present some risks to that company about public disclosure, um, the motives of the hacker. But a lot of companies have decided now that the benefits of encouraging research to improve their actual security related to products and services um, are worth the risk. So a lot of federal government agencies are exploring these. One, the NTIA, which is up on your screen, has um, a template out. They did a, a multi-stakeholder process. Um, this agency is within the Department of Commerce. And as a result of this multi-stakeholder uh, process, with which HackerOne was involved, I think, um, they've put out a template that gives sort of um, some of the considerations and what a disclosure policy might look like. The FTC. Uh, Federal Trade Commission has been active in this area. They've endorsed the NTIA uh, work product and they include um, vulnerability disclosures in their materials like their Start with Security Guide. Other cybersecurity frameworks like the International Standards Organization and the NIST cybersecurity framework are starting to include them as sort of a good thing that a company um, should consider. So let's talk a little bit about the benefits and the risks of these programs because Matt and I have counseled some clients who've asked, you know, should we do this? Or maybe someone in their IT department or in, in security drafts one. Um, and there are some benefits, but there are also some risks. And Alex should feel free to jump in here as well at any point because he's been on the ground dealing with companies doing this and he can speak to a lot of the benefits. Um, these vulnerability disclosure programs provide the chance for companies to use the what the research community considers the collective skills of these hackers. And as we've mentioned, there's lots of different motives, but assuming for purposes of this discussion uh, that there's good motive behind this, it does make some sense to sort of almost crowdsource your security, to have the people who are both interested in this and capable of it look at your products and services and have a way to communicate with them. Previously, some companies would, you know, just sort of put up a wall and be a little bit alarmed by these things, but they're starting to understand that this dialogue is helpful um, or can be helpful. So properly run programs can help companies both improve their security, but then also and this is a little bit of the carrot and stick idea, um, companies that don't invite or have a way to manage vulnerability notifications can face themselves, uh, can face hackers publicly releasing these vulnerabilities in an uncontrolled or chaotic manner. And when you look at, at sort of the update and patching world, the, the private sector does get some benefit from having order to this process rather than someone just posting on a website what a vulnerability might be and in inviting others to hack. So it's the idea of getting your arms around this process and trying to minimize the damage from uncontrolled disclosures. Um, theoretically, then these communications can improve cybersecurity by um, companies doing a better job, reacting more quickly to vulnerabilities, and also sharing information with their vendors and their supply chain. Um, there's lots of people in the ecosystem, as we like to call it, and the more communication about vulnerabilities, the better. Though, as we'll talk about, there are barriers to that communication that make it, you know, um, a little bit treacherous for companies. So that's some of the good things about these programs. Um, 
There are, however, some reasons for caution. Um, properly managing security vulnerabilities is challenging. We see in the news uh, various public disclosures about security flaws, whether it's um, last summer's hack of a Jeep or, or speculation about other security flaws. Public disclosure, particularly premature public disclosure, and what I mean by that is before the company has had a chance to address and fix the problem, can have a lot of harmful consequences. It can scare consumers. Um, competitors can exploit those vulnerabilities to their own advantage. You know, companies are selling products and services in a competitive market. Um, the appearance of better security for you, your company, is, um, is an advantage. Public disclosures, say a news report or a blog post, can inspire government oversight by Congress or by a federal agency or a state agency. Um, it can result in litigation, um, and it can facilitate attacks by hackers that are exploiting the vulnerability prior to your ability to remediate it. Um, as we've alluded to, the research community, which is very diverse, has varied motives. Some are genuinely trying to improve security. They're smart and they really want to improve the security of products and services and protect consumers. Some are looking to make money. Some are looking to make a name for themselves to then be hired by a technology company. Um, so there's a wide spectrum and some of them are, are willing to push the bounds of ethical and legal behavior. And I'll add on to that uh, quickly before um, I turn over to Alex to see if you have any thoughts on uh, this part as well. Um, before I was in the private sector, I was a federal prosecutor working on computer crimes, and one of the individuals that I prosecuted is a pretty good example of uh, the types of diverse motives that someone might have. Uh, this individual engaged in what was clearly black hat hacking. He had uh, found a way to hack into AdSense um, with Google and to steal hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, he was also doing uh, a lot of white hat hacking. Um, he was uh, looking at other companies and finding vulnerabilities and reporting to them without expectation of recognition or reward. He just um, found it and thought it was interesting and thought he would pass it along really from an altruistic perspective. This is just one individual who had very complex individual motives. And I raise that to show that when a company receives a vulnerability, it is um, difficult to assess who is on the other end, um, who this person from the public is, um, and what their motives are for trying to, uh, to pass this vulnerability on. Uh, so before we turn to the next section um, on examples, uh, Alex, do you want to weigh in here on some of the benefits and risks? Uh, I think I'd just touch on the, the last section talking about the diverse motives of, of researchers, and we can talk a little bit more about it later, but I think understanding and appreciating that is one of the, the key components to, to getting this right, because it is incredibly diverse, and uh, the one comment I would have on it is that one of the main misconceptions of, of folks prior to setting up their disclosure policies is the belief that the only people that are participating in them will proactively do so. Um, the research community quite regularly stumbles across vulnerabilities or becomes made aware of vulnerabilities that they weren't proactively trying to identify in the first place. Uh, Microsoft, in their vulnerability disclosure policies, they actually re refer to researchers as finders, hinting that sometimes the person who is made aware of a vulnerability isn't the one who was intentionally seeking it out in the first place. And so, uh, to some extent, you don't have full control over all of the motivations of folks who come into uh, knowledge of a particular vulnerability. And so making sure that there's a path that all different types of backgrounds and, and motivations can inform you of that uh, vulnerability is a uh, important uh, fact to consider. So going to the next slide, um, Let's take a look at what uh, this actually feels like in the real world and kind of get a flavor from some a couple different examples. Um, we've got three examples here, and I'll kind of just walk through them briefly to illustrate what we're talking about. Um, the first one is a headline from uh, reports related to uh, an exploit on Facebook's timeline. Um, uh, according to news articles, a researcher found this. Um, and supposedly alerted Facebook in some manner and uh, claimed that he was dissatisfied with Facebook's response um, and then turned around and said, well, I know how to get Facebook's attention. And he used the exploit to hack uh, 
Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook timeline. Um, and that was his way of kind of elevating what he considered, you know, a serious problem um, pretty high up. Uh, that's obviously not an ideal way for a company to find out about an exploit, um, but one example of how it happens uh, in practice at times. Uh, the next headline is from Wired Magazine, uh, and Megan touched on this earlier. Uh, security researchers, um, in connection with Wired, uh, looked to see if they could hack into a Jeep. Um, and they were able to do so and wrote a story about it along with uh, video, which is um, pretty interesting to watch, where they show uh, one of the researchers is driving on the highway and someone hacks into the Jeep and essentially uh, cuts Starts, does a bunch of different things with it, but eventually uh, cuts the engine on it. Um, this was uh, a disclosed to the public, or at least not necessarily how they went about it in great detail, but the fact that this could happen. Um, and I don't think that there were any ill intentions by the reporters uh, involved in this, but it had significant consequences for the company. Um, once this story became public, uh, they have faced class action lawsuits um, as well as a federal investigation into this. Um, and it remains to be seen where all that will go, but uh, they definitely have had negative consequences. Um, and that's without there being uh, an actual hack that resulted in harm from this. It was simply the disclosure of the vulnerability resulted in this litigation. Um, and not to say that the litigation is meritorious or not, but that it, it is a risk that is, exists. Um, the last example here uh, for uh, St. Jude, uh, there was uh, security researchers discovered a flaw in a uh, pacemaker that they were able to hack into the pacemaker. Uh, they did not go to the company that produced that. Uh, instead, they got a broker and they shorted the company's stock and then they went public with the vulnerability. Uh, stock price dropped and they made money that way. Um, obviously, a much different motivation for the people involved there, not an ideal scenario for the company, um, and conduct by the researchers that uh, to put it mildly, was questionable both legally and morally. Um, pretty serious uh, event. Um, so going to the next slide, this, we're kind of doing a little bit of the good, bad, and ugly about what this looks like in practice. Um, the One of the major players in the vulnerability disclosure area is Google. They announced back in 2014 the creation of Project Zero, uh, named for zero-day exploits, or exploits that have not been uh, discovered uh, yet. Uh, the goal of this project is for the, uh, it's a team of Google researchers who go out and basically look uh, wherever they are interested to try and uh, find exploits for uh, other companies, products, uh, applications, uh, servers, etc. cetera. Um, and then they, uh, it, their general practice is to notify the company, and I think that currently they try to give the company 90 days to respond. Um, they have uh, really received, uh, I would say, uh, it's been had a mixed reception. Um, Google's press on this, which is printed out here, uh, basically their motives for this are completely altruistic. They want to make the Internet safer, and so this is their way of going about doing that. Um, this also, obviously, gives them a tremendous commercial advantage um, and creates a lot of leverage for them in the marketplace. Uh, once they find a bug of a competitor, um, they are able to, you know, threaten to disclose that at any time, um, and it really uh, gives them a lot of leverage. Uh, as an example of that, uh, just in, I believe it was uh, last month, uh, Project Zero discovered a bug with Windows 10 uh, they contacted Microsoft, um, and Microsoft, uh, it, it, privately, this is not publicly disclosed at this point, uh, Microsoft did its best within 90 days to fix this flaw in Windows 10. Um, and I believe they thought they had patched it, but they hadn't completely patched it um, within the 90 days. Uh, and it was still a, an open vulnerability. Uh, and Google said, well, your 90 days are up, and they went public with the vulnerability um, before it has any kind of a fix. I, and I think that's a good example to show a couple things. Um, one that we're going to talk on, talk about uh, at more length, which is what do you do when you find a competitor's vulnerability? Um, 
but also it illustrates the point that getting a vulnerability and being told about a potential flaw is not the same thing as fixing it. Sometimes it's very easy to fix these. Other times it's very difficult. And here Microsoft, obviously an extremely sophisticated company, had 90 days to work on this and they weren't able to do it. And by all accounts, you know, they weren't ignoring this. It was just a really hard problem to be able to do, uh, which puts the company that receives a vulnerability uh, potentially in a difficult spot um, if they are now alerted to a vulnerability but don't have an immediate fix for it. That may be an uncomfortable place. Um, Alex, uh, do you want to weigh in on Google's Project Zero and your experience with them? I think you did a pretty good job covering it. I think we can jump into some of the some of the up upcoming examples. Right. Speaking of which, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, pretty newsworthy this year in uh, the cases where vulnerability disclosure starts to go a little bit better, usually triggered by some event in that organization of vulnerability disclosure gone wrong and, uh, and a desire to, to see it improved. Um, at the end of last year, the Department of Defense introduced the first vulnerability disclosure policy for a federal agency, which is quite newsworthy as they were one of the original sponsors of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and have probably brought in uh, more cases against hackers, both criminally and uh, and civilly, than any other single organization. They've been, uh, as the uh, original founders of the internet, have been policing it and responding to uh, uh, criminal behavior on it for uh, longer than most folks. Something that was pretty unique about this program, aside from the pure scope of it, the DOD's footprint on the on the internet is just is just tremendous, is that they went out of their way to consult with the Department of Justice in the establishment of their disclosure policy. And had the uh, approval from the, the DOJ that their approach would be uh, 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 suitable within the uh, lines of, of criminal behavior out here. And so it was one of the first signals that we've had since vulnerability disclosure policy started becoming the norm that the Department of Justice is equally respecting them and it is creating a, a somewhat of a safe harbor for this type of research and, and disclosure to uh, to occur. But if we go on to the, the next slide, we'll, I wanted to touch on a, another story of disclosure gone wrong and then uh, changed a little bit. This is a, an example of a, a security researcher who goes by the name of uh, Hamakov, who by day is a security professional, runs a security consulting firm, but also does a, a, a good deal of vulnerability disclosure on the side. Um, he, is a, he is a hacker, so he loves caffeine. No, uh, no hacker <laughs> operates without any caffeine. And as we talk about the range of motivations out here, um, didn't set out to hack Starbucks, but received Starbucks gift cards for, uh, um, I forget the exact circumstances, as, a, as gift from, uh, gifts from a friend. And in the process of using his card, tinkered with them a little bit and found ways to uh, get additional funds on his card without actually paying for them. Went about it in what he would describe as a pretty ethical manner um, and went out of his way to disclose it to Starbucks who lacked a vulnerability disclosure policy at the time. Um, they worked through their, their legal department to establish communication with him and made absolutely certain that uh, Hamakov was aware that his activity was uh, fraudulent and probably illegal, which is factually correct, right? He, he is uh, capable of performing fraudulent actions. He did load a dollar and seventy cents onto his card to prove that it actually worked and stole a dollar and seventy cents from from Starbucks like it's a, uh, uh, a fraudulent action even though he's attempting to uh, report it in a, in a benign manner but the the point of all this is that even though the vulnerability is fixed now this is not the ideal circumstance either for uh, Starbucks who gets dragged through the mud a little bit in the public but also uh, from Hamakov's perspective, who was trying to do the right thing but put a pretty considerable legal risk on himself in the process and it could have gone much worse. But it also sets the, the um, uh, precedent here with Starbucks that is very unlikely for anyone else to want to come forward in the future if this is the type of response that uh, uh, a finder of a vulnerability can, uh, can expect. Um, and on the next slide, we've got an example of 
uh, Hamakavu has he's having this back and forth in this exchange with with Starbucks of being able to demonstrate how vulnerability disclosure works in a more structured and controlled fashion. Um, this is an example of a, of a vulnerability that the same individual had reported to Twitter, who at the time had a very mature vulnerability disclosure process. And you see at the beginning him describing the vulnerability, a bit of a conversation back and forth with the, uh, the security team there. But at the very bottom of the slide, you see a very explicit uh, coordination of a disclosure request between them. Um, and in this case, they're not even having any conversation about it. Hamakab's just asking if the, the, his, his vulnerability can be uh, disclosed publicly and the, the company agreeing to it. Uh, vulnerability disclosures can get much more uh, complicated here, but what this is demonstrating is that the individual who had a very negative experience and a very adversarial experience with Starbucks, at the very same time is having very healthy, productive relationships with other organizations who do have those policies. And so if we fast forward again, um, Starbucks ended up becoming the first uh, restaurant and uh, uh, food provider on the internet to implement a vulnerability disclosure policy where they decided that the situation they had with Hamakov isn't the uh, ideal outcome. Um, they worked with their, their legal teams to define a set of rules and a policy by which people in the future who uh, believe they have knowledge of a vulnerability in Starbucks should uh, test that vulnerability and report it. And this isn't terribly complex. You can read through it a bit and find how they're uh, crafting a balance here that both protects Starbucks and their existing customers and the data that they're responsible for and the researchers who are attempting to uh, report vulnerabilities. Um, and you'll see that last bullet point here, the uh, do not disclose reported vulnerabilities until they've had a reasonable time to address it, just really starts to set the, the tone that they're, they welcome working with you, but there are a few uh, guardrails here. And what they found when they, when they launched this was that um, there were quite a few individuals who had been aware of Starbucks vulnerabilities prior to the existence of this policy, um, but absent any way to report those, hadn't gone out of their way to disclose it. So immediately by launching this, this program, they become, and signifying that they're willing to work with the community, they learned about vulnerabilities um, pretty much right out the gate. Then uh, hopefully the next time someone comes along, it's not it's not newsworthy. Worthy, no customers are at risk, and there's a safe and responsible manner for these uh, issues to be addressed. Thanks, Alex. Okay. So we've gone through a nice sort of this is the legal framework. These are the pros and cons, um, some of the benefits and risks of um, going down this path. I think that last bullet on the Starbucks slide tees up the next discussion really well. Starbucks program says, you know, give us reasonable time to address. The question of what is a reasonable time is one of the many kinds of issues that a company thinking about this is going to have to grapple with. So if you are thinking about setting up a vulnerability disclosure program, and in this discussion, you might see a little bit of daylight between where Matt and I are on these things in terms of uh, seeing risk and um, where HackerOne is. But in terms of the considerations that someone is going to have to do or think about, first you have to decide you know, whether to adopt the program, um, second, how to scope it, third, whether you have the resources to properly staff it, fourth, how you're going to resolve the issues and whether you'll document that, and then understand the obligations you have, if any, to notify your partners, regulators, and the public. So we'll take each of these in turn. Um, in deciding whether to adopt a program, as Matt alluded to, the whole legal framework under, for example, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act really turns on consent. It's not a crime to go into someone's computer if you have appropriate consent, and we're not going to belabor what that looks like. There, are lots of, of nuances in when DOJ brings prosecutions, but um, the whole idea is you tell the world the terms under which you're going to provide your consent for someone to do certain kinds of activities. So the NTIA sample policy would allow hackers to engage in certain kinds of activities and provide sort of broad immunity or protections from lawsuits, from um, as a result of the consent from criminal prosecution, but also from lawsuits to anyone who submits vulnerability reports in the prescribed manner. 
Um, so some companies may not want to go down this path. It is intrusive. You are inviting people to hack into you. It's subject to your terms, but you are allowing and opening the door to activity that is going to be somewhat fraught. So that's the sort of first choice, whether you want to go down this path. Some companies may feel like if their competitors are doing it, they need to do it. Others may decide it's the, the lesser of a few evils, one of which is um, like the hacking of the Facebook feed of Mark Zuckerberg or in a situation we've confronted, you know, an email from a customer to the CEO of a company saying, I found this problem. Well, the CEO is not happy to get that and may not know precisely how to respond to it. So companies have to weigh all of these different things as well as the rights they're giving up in terms of their ability to sue both under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act but also under copyright law and some of the protections that are given to software and other anti-circumvention tools. So then the second real threshold question you're going to have to get to is how are you going to scope it? What are you going to want to allow? Um, are you going to just open the door to looking at all of your products and services or start small with only one product or your website or one application? There are lots of other scoping questions, but really it's about what you want to invite people to do. Um, and then you'll want to have that reflected clearly in your communications with the public about the scope of your program and what you're willing to accept and how you will accept communications. Lots of details are found in that NTIA policy. And I'll add on that, the part of this is going to be how uh, it is going to be establishing clear lines of communication uh, with the hacking community. Uh, and part of that is setting expectations for whether or not there will be a financial reward, whether or not there's going to be public recognition of vulnerabilities that are found, what response times will be. Uh, making sure that these things are set up clearly uh, will at least help to mitigate some of the uncertainty for dealing with a population that, as we've discussed, may have lots of mixed motivations. Staffing. The other thing that companies are going to have to think about is, and this has come up for companies that are maybe smaller and mid-size, is do you really have the manpower to deal with the receipt of lots of negative reports that may come in? You know, when you open the door to negative reporting, you're going to get some negative reports. And for small companies who may not have a robust IT and security department, um, this may be more than you want to bite off. Um, this is where I think HackerOne can be of some assistance, but it still requires internal manpower to, to resolve these complaints, to evaluate them, um, and make a determination of whether a report is legitimate and valid and whether um, you need to take steps to address it, and if so, what those steps are. There's also going to be the, the staffing and other logistics necessary for dealing with uh, press or public inquiries about it. So that's sort of a practical um, caution that even though a program may be wonderful, if you can't staff it properly, you may be inviting more problems than solutions. Matt? So the, one of the other things that companies need to decide in setting up a vulnerability program is to determine how they're going to resolve reports. Uh, one thing that uh, I touched on earlier with Google's Project Zero is Microsoft had 90 days to resolve uh, a vulnerability, um, and wasn't, they weren't able to do so during that time. And that kind of illustrates a potential problem here um, in that companies are going to receive vulnerabilities that they aren't going to be able to immediately fix. There's a few reasons for this. The first is, as it, shown by Microsoft, Sometimes this is just hard. Uh, it's difficult to do, um, and an immediate turnaround is not, uh, not possible. Uh, another problem is that uh, it's difficult to triage and appropriately prioritize uh, incoming vulnerability reports. Uh, when there is a uncertainty about who's providing the report, it's more difficult to tell, is this a valid report? Um, the person who is describing it to me claims that it is a really urgent vulnerable vulnerability. Is that really the case? Um, so it, companies have to be able to internally evaluate, um, is this real, how big of a problem it is, and if it is real and a significant problem, can they fix it in time? Um, the, so that is going to mean that in this triage process, 
companies are going to have to be able to um, or would be well advised to document how they're going about this process um, as vulnerabilities come in. Uh, you can see what the risk down the line might be uh, if this wasn't handled well. Uh, say a company releases a product and there ends up being a hacking incident related to that product. Uh, in litigation that follows up, discovery shows that they had a vulnerability disclosure program and there were a couple dozen vulnerabilities that had been reported related to this product. Irrespective of whether or not those vulnerabilities actually were related to the hacking incident, you can imagine what the plaintiff's lawyers are going to do. They're going to say this company had this program, but they were just completely negligent. Um, they didn't pay any attention to it. They knew their product was filled with holes, um, and yet they let it out on the marketplace. Uh, the reality might be completely different, that these were um, vulnerabilities that were determined to not be a high priority or not to be valid and completely unrelated to whatever an incident might be. The trick is going to be for a company, as they're receiving vulnerabilities, to be able to uh, document how they are triaging and handling these in a way that will be defensible down the line um, should this uh, come to light in a more public setting. If I could interject one thing here, Matt, one additional complexity um, that affects how you will both resolve reports but also how you may scope your program may relate to the differences in resolution, particularly contrasting, say, a large company that produces its own operating system like Microsoft versus a product manufacturer who may rely on someone else to provide software and operating system applications, other things. So if you have a, a product or service that will be com very complicated to patch or update, or if the business relationship wouldn't support a rapid response, that can shape what areas you will want to include within your, pro your program and or how you anticipate resolving them. Because if a resolution is going to depend on a third party over whom you may have little leverage, that should inform how you go about this because you may invite vulnerabilities that you're not going to be practically able to expeditiously resolve. Um, that's something we see in supply chains for technology companies and service providers is the supply chains can be extraordinarily complex um, and some devices hit end of life. So just another thing to think about. I, and I think that flows right in uh, nicely into the next point, which is the companies need to understand what their notification obligations are, um, what may be required in terms of notification, um, or may be appropriate or prudent to do. Um, and this is really going to be very fact specific for uh, a company and what its, uh, what its uh, business model is and where it fits uh, within a supply chain or who its customers are. Um, the notification obligations and requirements for uh, a, pace, a company that creates pacemakers might be very different than a company that creates um, you know, a, a social media app, for, for example. Um, but this is something that at the initial setting of a program, uh, I think it's important for a company to really look through and understand uh, who it may have to or want to notify should it receive either a vulnerability about its own product um, or a vulnerability uh, about a product that is related to, to its services, um, you know, that's a, a, a vendor uh, product that they use on a regular basis um, or other commercially sourced uh, components. Um, and you can see, you know, Google's approach uh, through Project Zero in terms of notifying others about their vulnerabilities is fairly aggressive. Um, they give the 90-day window, but then uh, will go public with it. Um, that's one approach, um, but there are many others, and the obligations may change pretty dramatically depending on a company's uh, contractual relationships as well as its relationship uh, with federal or state governments that um, may create a, a different scenario. Um, and of course, the type of owner, uh, type of product involved, um, you know, if it is something that involves, uh, you know, physical security or something along those lines, um, there may be heightened uh, legal or moral reasons for providing notification. Um, so this is something, you know, that uh, it's tough to provide a one-size-fits-all approach to this uh, point at the beginning. But for each company, as they're scoping this out, initially needs to uh, really reflect on how they're going to handle telling others about vulnerabilities, um, in particular with their own products. Hey, Alex, do you have any um, thoughts or 
observations from your experience on these cautionary notes that we've just sounded? I do. I think um, you're exactly right that it's hard to have a overarching guidance from the that applies to absolutely everybody. And I think that the things that I would keep in mind in this is that the, the uniform thing that is true across all of these is that absent of a formal policy or a formal program, you end up losing control over all of this. And eventually, at some point in time, you're going to have to have that conversation of should we provide notice to uh, customers or supply chain or, or vendors, and you want to be the one having that conversation. You don't want to leave it up to an external hacker to figuring it out on their own if they've found a vulnerability and are making a decision about how to provide notice uh, independent of, of you being in that conversation. And so it's a tricky conversation, but it is one that sooner or later everyone who's creating meaningful technology has until we figure out how to create software that has no vulnerabilities. At some point in time, you're going to have to notify customers of a vulnerability, and you want that to be dictated by an informed, proactive policy on your side rather than something that's reactionary once the first of vulnerability is, is, uh, is identified. And getting ahead of that is uh, a clear benefit even if you have to acknowledge that it's not currently in, a, in an ideal state today. At least being aware of that puts you, uh, puts you out ahead of most other uh, folks in the, in the space. Great, thanks very much. So in terms of takeaways, what we are hoping folks leave with is a sense of sort of what's coming down the road from what government and others are expecting and starting to migrate towards. As I mentioned, um, the NTIA and other proceedings are looking at these. The NIST cybersecurity framework for improving cybersecurity is starting to include this. That's what was talked about at the most recent government meeting is that folks do want these sorts of programs to be included. Um, whether or not that's a good idea, I won't weigh in on, but that looks to be one of the trends. Um, while the opportunity to improve cybersecurity from these programs is quite promising, the idea, the idea of harnessing ethical hackers to help a company sort of crowdsource security does make sense. It is risky because you are consenting to be hacked and a poorly implemented program could result in more headache than you bargained for in terms of unnecessary publicity, litigation, or government oversight, particularly if your company is not prepared um, to handle these and doesn't have a clear sense of what kinds of vulnerabilities you want to be informed of and how you're going to be handling them. Um, I think it's clear, and HackerOne can certainly vouch for this, that you know what, whether you scope your program broadly or not, Companies that lack a clear vulnerability disclosure program are at increased risk should a security researcher find a vulnerability, which then they may disclose in a chaotic manner. Um, so if a company decides to adopt a program, it needs to know what options are available and build a program that's tailored to its situation. So Alex, I think HackerOne is going to wrap us up. Yeah, thanks guys. Um, real quick, for, um, before I hand it over to Alex, uh, for, so we can have a, about 15 minutes left for Q&A. Um, sorry about any uh, issues for the, the list for the uh, slides. Well, definitely on the recording, we can uh, make sure we have the correct slides throughout the uh, entire presentation for us. Uh, one thing we did want to uh, kind of just bring to the front, a lot of the issues that are being discussed here on our webinar today, uh, you know, HackerOne has, has an answer with the VDP platform. Uh, it is an ISO compliant solution designed for the organization to receive, resolve, and respond to security vulnerabilities from researchers or finders and hackers. So we also have a buyer's guide, what we call Pathfinder report from 451. You can go to our website and check that out on the resources page. We'll have all the links and this good stuff coming in after the webinar. That's enough for me. Alex, I'm going to hand it over to you uh, to see any questions we've come in. Make sure uh, listeners to put your questions in that question box and uh, Alex will hand it over to you. Thanks very much, Luke. I'm, uh, yeah, if anyone had any questions, get them uh, into the box right now and we'll get them answered for you. Otherwise, I, uh, 
I think we can uh, we can wrap up. Hey Alex, we have a couple of questions. I'm trying to pull them up now. Um, someone asks, and Alex, I think this is for you. Is there a going rate um, right now for bounties for different kinds of vulnerability? I think that's actually a great practical question about what these things look like. You know, I think on the Starbucks website you showed there was I saw 1,400, I saw 100. What are we talking about in terms of bounties for those programs that include bounties? It's a, it's a really good question, and I think one of the things I'd like to, to, to reiterate really heavily at the start of this is that the default price for every vulnerability out there really is zero dollars. When you're thinking about one of these programs, you want to start from having a policy of just how you can be made aware of them. And if you've never received a vulnerability report from the outside, the step one there is really just to implement a policy and start receiving those that people are finding reactively without any type of incentive. Um, incentives are kind of a, a much more mature version of a, of a bug bounty program, and they tend to come about a little bit later in the life cycle once you have established mature vulnerability disclosure processes, and you're at a point where you as an organization make the decision that you want to start actively incentivizing people to look more aggressively. Not just giving them permission to, to look and disclose in a safe manner, but to say, here's what we would really like you to, uh, to go after. And the organizations who take that path tend to start from a very narrow scoping process. They don't just pay for every vulnerability that comes in. They're describing what vulnerabilities would have the most impact on their, their business, and that's when they're really crowdsourcing security in a way that um, is asking for specific things. Um, the range there is pretty dramatic. You see vulnerabilities as low as uh, $50 and uh, bounties offered as high as $50,000 and, and $100,000. Across the HackerOne platform, the average price for a, a vulnerability is around $500 to $600, although the more competitive programs are paying several thousand dollars per vulnerability. Um, but if you're at a point where you're still deciding should I have a vulnerability disclosure policy, that really is the, the first step. And I would encourage you to uh, get many of those questions answered before you try to answer what should we pay for a vulnerability. That's really um, something that you uh, move into after you've identified a good balance for your organization on the benefits and risks of just uh, an unincentivized vulnerability disclosure policy. Great. I'm looking at another question, which is how to keep security researchers engaged and how to establish relationships with security researchers outside of just your public-facing website or your public-facing disclosure program. Do you have any tips on that and whether that's useful? Absolutely. The um Yeah, it's this really is the beginning of that relationship. And if you're already if you're asking the question of how do we keep people engaged and how do we build stronger relationships with them, those are really healthy questions to be asking. And it's a, a sign that you're probably at a point where your organization's a good fit for uh, for one of these programs and uh, and these policies. Um, the mere act of putting a disclosure policy out there, I think you'll find, is uh, puts you in the, the leading edge of the organizations out there and is a a, a huge first step in establishing goodwill with the security research community. Beyond that, the research community and the security community in general likes to see uh, quick response times and as much transparency as, as is possible during that process. As Matt and Megan talked about during the earlier discussions, it's pretty common for there to be some complexity involved in resolving security vulnerabilities. And as much as you're able to share with researchers in that process, um, the better relationships you'll have with them going forward. If it is going to take you a while or you have to coordinate with supply chains or you've decided that it's low risk and mitigated in other ways, um, think ahead about how much you're able to share and what you're not able to share in order to um, have as much of a conversation as possible rather than just defaulting to the, uh, the no comment approach. One second, we're just going to give another moment to see if we have any other questions out here. 
There's a question here for uh, Matt and Megan on um, uh, your, your firm's lo located in D.C. and the viewer asks, are there any other themes you're seeing from the uh, legislative side? Any insights into what we can expect from, uh, from that side? I'm guessing that's a question around expanding into what you're seeing from the uh, from the NTIA. Yeah, I think there's, uh, thanks, I think there's a lot of government interest in this, certainly in Congress, in these IOT, the Internet of Things caucuses, there's a lot of focus there and in several federal agencies on what are we going to do about the security of the Internet of Things. One aspect of that necessarily is fixing security vulnerabilities, updates and patching. And what we see in these discussions with both regulators as well as um, our clients and, and other folks who are in the space is a, is a focus on vulnerability reporting and this idea that we're not as a, I don't want to be too prosaic here, as a society, getting the information to circulate fast enough about vulnerabilities. And so public disclosure or controlled industry disclosure is very attractive to people because they want to be able to have rapid responses to vulnerabilities. And I think the government is now looking at the private sector to see what are you doing to deal with this problem, particularly as it relates to all of these connected devices that are going to be out there that I think are going to be targets for both ethical hacking and mischief, to put it mildly. Um, I think there's going to be increased um, interest in these sorts of programs. They're being included in the next round of updates to the cybersecurity framework. The NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, is quarterbacking that. I, they have said they will include vulnerability disclosure programs in their framework as something that companies should consider and possibly use. And in the in President Trump's executive order on cybersecurity, there's a a lot of focus on botnets and Internet of Things issues, and I think these issues naturally will flow into vulnerability disclosure programs as a way to help elevate security overall and increase communication about these issues. And I'll just add on to that. The FTC has also issued statements uh, discussing the importance of vulnerability disclosure programs, um, and I think that as we've discussed throughout that there is becoming more of a trend for companies to uh, either have one or have an explanation for why they don't have one, I think is uh, where we're coming at. So I think one thing I would expect is that um, those who are consumer facing, either as product manufacturers or service providers, um, are going to be expected to consider these. And also critical infrastructure operators may want to consider it. Um, I think the DOD, as we discussed earlier with um, Alex's description of the novelty of the DOD program, you're seeing a desire in Congress to have other federal agencies um, similarly adopt these programs. I think that impulse will extend to operators of critical infrastructure. Um, if folks think this is a good way to spot early vulnerabilities and prevent future attacks, it wouldn't surprise me if um, regulators look to ask or expect that their regulated entities will consider or implement these programs. I think, uh, Matt, and Megan, you might have just preempted the next question that came in with your, with your last comments, but uh, a viewer asked, do you think there will be a legal precedent established that links failure to uh, respond to a vulnerability reported to liability with a, with a security incident? Uh, yeah, I think uh, we have at least partially answered that, and the answer is uh, potentially um, that that is at least looking like uh, this is something that regulators uh, are considering uh, or beginning to consider to be part of mature cybersecurity. Um, and so uh, we're not there yet, but it, there is a, uh, a bit of a movement or growing expectation that companies will have properly implemented vulnerability disclosure programs when that's appropriate. And one, one thing just to pick up on something Matt said earlier about when you're structuring these programs, you need to think about how you process the reports that you get. Um, one thing we've seen in FTC enforcement actions relating to product and service security as well as post-breach enforcement actions, say for example against Wyndham after they were hacked by Russian cyber criminals, um, what was very impactful to the FTC was a perceived failure by the hacked company to 
take action after the first or second problem. Um, so I think when a company gets reports of vulnerabilities or problems, there is an expectation that they will do something about them because, you know, if you don't address it and six months later it results in a bigger problem, it's going to be very frustrating to an enforcement agency or a regulator, um, which is why companies need to really think about at the outset how they're going to define vulnerabilities, what sort of proof they're going to require, um, how they're going to validate these things, because what is a vulnerability to one person might not be a vulnerability to another. Um, so I think there will be an expectation that you'll take action on things about which you are put on notice. Sounds good. The, the next question that uh, was asked here is, what are the recommended criteria to select security researchers suitable for an invitation-only program? I'm, uh, I think I can dive in there a bit because I, I think uh, someone's been reading some other online material since we didn't cover it in the, in the talk here. But one of the more common ways that organizations first start to introduce these programs is in an invitation-only capacity. Since there are some risks and some unanswered questions early on in the stages of these programs, many organizations will choose to not publish, to publish early drafts of their disclosure policies to a limited set of, of security researchers. Um, in, uh, I can describe HackerOne's approach and some, some external approaches to that, and then Matt and I'm going to be curious if you have any input on that. Um, on HackerOne's side, uh, an invitation only is the, the default mechanism for launching programs for anyone who hasn't received vulnerability reports in the past, and we use our uh, reputation system to help organizations select researchers that are good candidates for early exposure to those policies. For organizations that are implementing one uh, outside of a platform with an email address or the like, it's in a similar fashion, typically with researchers who have reported issues to them in the past. Now, that means setting up an email address but not uh, publishing the email address to the world and sharing a draft version of that disclosure policy with anyone who's attempted to contact them in the, in the past, whether that's the uh, EFF or the FTC or security researchers that have contacted them uh, out of bands. Uh, Matt, Megan, anything to, to add to that? Have you um, um, encountered any uh, invitation-only uh, disclosure policies? Yeah, I th the one piece I'll add, I, you know, that certainly is a means of giving a company a lot more comfort um, to know who they're dealing with rather than some person who's on the internet, right? Um, and so I think uh, there are several advantages to the invitation-only approach. Uh, and one of the real basic ones is if this you have vetted to figure out that this is a person whom you can contact um, and actually know who they are, uh, you know, that really helps put you uh, ahead of the game in terms of being able to trust them a little bit more um, and not wondering if they're also the person who hacked you three weeks ago um, and is kind of playing fast and loose with you. Um, it can, is a way to provide a lot more comfort there. Sounds good. And I think we've got, in, uh, got all our questions answered with uh, just about one minute to spare. So I want to I thank everyone on the, on the call for joining us and Matt and Megan in particular for sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. We appreciate it as well. Great. Awesome, guys. Well, that concludes our webinar. Thank you again for those listening. We will be sending a recording as well as the slides for you all to view after. Have a great day.